I've got 6.01 Eastern time, three o'clock on the West Coast, other times in between. So let's begin tonight's uh, presentation. We're really glad you're here. Uh, my name is Mark Reek. I'm the ex Senior Executive for the Arthritis Foundation in Los Angeles. And uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, tonight's MC. I'm really excited about tonight's presentation because like many of you, I've spent the last year uh, more sedentary than normal. You know, I either sit a lot or in this case, stand in one place a lot and then go out on the weekends and uh, attempt to play golf or, or be even more active and, and wonder why Monday morning my shoulders hurt and, and I have other uh, issues that are, get aggravated as a result of the, uh, the OA that I live with every day. So uh, tonight our, our guests are gonna discuss a, a range of solutions for pain relief, answer your questions on joint pain in the neck, shoulders, elbows, wrists, and hands, uh, above the waist. And, and so, uh, you know, events like this are really informed and driven by patients like you. Uh, and it's with your input that we create our education tools and resources and programs to speak to what's really important to you. And uh, we really want to help you live your best life. Uh, that's why I'd like to share a short video with you to tell you about our insights program so you can make your voice heard and help us uh, create more programs like this one. So we'll, we'll run a short video. By taking part in the Live Yes Insights Assessment, you help change lives today, including your own, and you help change the future of arthritis. It takes just 10 minutes or less to share your experience and make a difference. Answer simple questions, like how often you felt arthritis pain in the last week. Ongoing insights data from people like you will lead to new resources that ease daily life. Your insights show what kind of support you need in your community. You improve the healthcare system. You focus researchers and others on top priorities You'll make more research funding possible, leading to new groundbreaking treatments. The power is in your hands to change things now and for the future. This is your opportunity to change the future of arthritis. Thank you for sharing that. Power really is in your hands and uh, just a note, we also recently launched our JA Insights program. So if you're a parent of a child with JA, we really encourage you to enroll in that program as well. Now, before we begin tonight, I'd like to share a few announcements and, and, and notes uh, before we get to tonight's event. First of all, Walk to Cure Arthritis. It is walk season and this year's theme is walk your way. So we hope that you will uh, look at walktocurearthritis.org for uh, the, the event nearest you and, and join us. We're virtual for the most part this year, and but there, people are walking their way. We're cycling, we're swimming, we're walking, we're running. What's important is that you be active and support the organization. So we hope that you'll join us start a Facebook fundraiser and make a difference in uh, our community. Uh, JA conference and camps, you know, health and safety are really the, the number one concerns that we have for our families and constituents. And, you know, tough decision this year to take our conference and camps virtual. Um, you know, we're gonna miss the in-person events. However, it's really an opportunity to expand our network, to expand the people that can participate in our events and activities, and for you to introduce others to the, the programs that you enjoy. So I hope that you'll join us and that you'll invite others to do the same. And again, you see the, uh, uh, the URLs that you can click on to register and participate. And don't forget, uh, if you don't have one already, JA Parents, the JA Power Pack is something that uh, is so beneficial to people and help you through a new diagnosis and uh, provide that support. Uh, so, 
couple of housekeeping notes for tonight's event. All attendees have been muted, but you can direct your questions through the, you know, from the webinar through the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen, because we really want your questions and we want to provide answers. That's the, the whole reason for being with us tonight uh, is to provide value to you. So you will also get a, uh, an email in a, in a day or two about your experience tonight. I hope you'll complete the survey and uh, you know, help us track the success of our sessions, show us things that we can do to plan better for future events. So you've been kind enough to listen to all of this. Let's get started. Uh, tonight's event is going to be moderated by my volunteer partner uh, and chair elect of the Los Angeles uh, board. And his name is Dr. Hunter Vincent. Uh, Dr. Vincent is a, is a pain management and regenerative medicine specialist and the director of the clinical research program at Ortho Healing Center in Los Angeles. Uh, Hunter has authored several peer reviewed publications, multiple textbooks, chapters on orthobiologics and sports medicine and pain management. Uh, I also happen to know that uh, Hunter was a division one soccer player and, and races mountain bikes. So he uh, uh, is an active guy. Uh, Dr. Vincent is also the annual moderator for the Orthobiologic Institute, a premier symposium with cadaver labs featuring the foremost experts in tendon, cartilage and spine disease from around the world. So we're bringing you our best as our moderator tonight, Dr. Vincent, welcome and thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for our Above the Waist Joint Pain Solutions webinar. Thank you, Mark, for that great introduction and for the introductory remarks. That was phenomenal. You're made for Hollywood. So it's perfect, perfect role for the Los Angeles branch. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to participate today, and hopefully myself and the rest of the experts on our panel can answer all of your burning questions about joint pain, uh, whether that's the shoulder, the wrist, the the neck, anything above the waist, that's the only rule. Uh, but first, we're going to kick things off with a few educational slides so we can kind of discuss a few of things surrounding joint pain in general. So when we look at the anatomy of musculoskeletal pain, you know, we oftentimes at the Arthritis Foundation think of joints in particular. That's because our community is you know, was surrounded to, you know, in educating patients and family members on arthritis. However, when we look at pain in general, uh, above the waist, of course, because that's the topic of this webinar, uh, there's a lot of other areas and a lot of other pain generators that can be contributing to pain uh, around joints. And so let's take the shoulder, for example. Now, the shoulder has a lot of different structures that are in that same vicinity. And it's important for patients to be aware of these and understand that they can be contributing to the underlying joint disease that they may have. And so, for example, if you, if you look at the shoulder there, you have the muscles, you have the biceps, you have different tendons that cross the joint, you have ligaments that are surrounding the, the shoulder joint, and you also have a bursa. Now, a bursa is, I think, I like to think of it like a, a little Ziploc bag filled with a little bit of fluid, and it helps the tendons move a little bit more efficiently and effectively. However, these bursa and these little small sacks of fluid can get irritated and inflamed, and they can also cause pain. So outside of the spectrum of joint disease and arthritis, you can have other structures that can become irritated and can become injured. And it's important to be aware of those and talk with your, your sports or your therapist or your surgeon about those other possibilities. So next slide. And so again, you know, to discuss a little bit more some of the causes of these pain, of this pain, of this musculoskeletal pain. So, you know, if we take chronic diseases as one possible area or a contributing factor for pain, you have arthritis, of course, whether that's inflammatory or degenerative. You also have other centralized pain syndromes such as fibromyalgia, which can be contributing, which can be contributing to widespread pain across multiple areas, including near joints, uh, as well as nerve conditions. So a lot of times people think of sciatica, which obviously I know is uh, generally below the waist, 
however, you can also have other nerve impingements in the upper extremities as well as carpal tunnel syndrome. And so these can also be contributing to areas of pain around joints and in conjunction with joint pain. So then you have also sprains and strains of uh, ligaments and muscles, and that can be obviously a result of overuse, or it can be a result of trauma, whether that's, you know, a slip and fall injury, whether that's a sports injury, whatever it might be. Um, and then, you know, one of these, the added things that the Arthritis Foundation has put in here is the poor posture. And I think that a lot of times that can contribute to some of the muscle pain that patients are experiencing, uh, especially in the neck and the shoulder area. A lot of times as we've been trapped in Zoom world for the last 18 months, you know, we've been looking down, we've been sitting a lot more, you know, we've been on our phones a lot more, and this can contribute to forward posture of the head, which can place more stress in the muscles of the, the neck and the shoulders. And that poor posture can contribute to some of the muscle pain and ligament pain and things like that, that was discussed prior. Next slide. And so, you know, just to recap a, a few of the descriptive words of pain, uh, you know, this, I think this is important because sometimes, you know, patients come into my office and I'm sure the other experts as well, and they're trying to describe their symptoms and it's sometimes quite difficult. And the reason for that is sometimes you can have multiple pain generators and multiple descriptors that describe each one. But, you know, here's a brief overview that we can kind of discuss. So, you know, typically, if you have more, I would say, deep pain or sharp and stabbing pain, you know, a lot of times that can be coming from bone itself as a generator of pain. Sharp shooting pains, typically in a, in a localized area, let's say the elbow or in the shoulder, that can be coming from more of a, a tendon injury or a ligament, right? Um, stiff, grinding, popping, clicking noises. A lot of times those can be coming from joints. And I'm sure that some of the people on this webinar right now are, are very familiar with that, uh, whether that's inflammatory or degenerative arthritis. Um, however, it's also important to, to note that popping and grinding is not necessarily bad. You know, your, your joints are moving, right? Sometimes it can be the tendons that are moving across each other in tissue. And, you know, a lot of times that popping is normal and it's a way of, you know, the, the body is regulating itself in that sense. So not necessarily always bad. Um, when we think of soreness, you know, a lot of times, you know, typical soreness is a good descriptor for muscle type pain. You can get that after exercise or kind of that, uh, almost that heavy feeling that you have if you go for a longer walk or you go for a longer run. Um, and then, you know, sensitivity to touch or sensitivity to light touch throughout the body, uh, tenderness throughout the body. These are kind of signs of more chronic widespread pain. So similar to the fibromyalgia type sensation. And then pins and needles or burning and tingling, these are good descriptors of nerve type pain. Okay, so that's just a brief recap there. One more next slide if we have one, I don't think we do. Perfect. So that's just a few educational slides just to kind of warm things up to get your brain thinking about good questions that you can ask all of our expert panel. So now I'd like to introduce our three featured experts for the Q&A session this evening. And they are happy to answer any and all questions that you have ranging from conservative care all the way to surgical treatments. Now, our first expert is Dr. Marsha Lawrence. She's earned her doctorate in physical therapy as well as a certificate in hand therapy. She's practiced in a variety of clinical settings, including the Curtis National Hand Center, Duke University Medical Center, the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and most recently, the University of Iowa Healthcare. She serves as the Practice Affairs Chair of the American Physical Therapy Association of Hand and Upper Extremity, and she's a board member of the National Hand Therapy Foundation. So we're certainly happy to have someone of her tenure on our panel today. Our second expert is double board certified in orthopedic surgery and sports medicine. He practices in Los Angeles, California, and his specialties are shoulder, elbow, and knee surgery. So we will welcome Dr. Nima Moran to our Zoom stage here shortly. And our third guest is Gary Solomon. He is the Director of Therapy at Chicago Metro Hand Therapy. He's currently the Vice Chairman of the American Hand Therapy Foundation and an affiliate board member for the American Association for Hand Surgery. He's also the past president of the American Society of Hand Therapists and also served 
as Education Division Director for ASHT. So let's go ahead and kick on those cameras and unmute yourself and we'll welcome you to our virtual stage this afternoon. So if you are out there in our virtual world, feel free to submit your questions here in the chat feature and our Arthritis Foundation staff members will be sure to update us on these questions. But we do have some questions that have come in a little bit earlier on and they have been pre-screened as good solid questions. So why don't we go ahead and kick it off here to our panel of experts and I'll start in our general category. So this one will go out to you, Marsha. This question is, should I quit certain exercises to prevent further damage from my shoulder and wrists? I love to golf. So I would never tell you to stop golfing, number one. Um, I think it's really important that you do the things that you really love to do. What I would tell you to do is go have an evaluation done so they can determine where the muscle imbalances or movement problems may be at your shoulder, or it may be actually in your torso and your uh, stance in your hips. It may be the entire body that needs to look at the way you're swinging and the way you're distributing force to see if we can make that force a little less as you follow through when you golf. There also may be some adjustments you can make to your equipment to your clubs, for instance, or your, or your golf glove that may help to reduce some of the vibration transmission up the, up the club, which may help your shoulder as well. So I would definitely tell you not to stop, but I would tell you to go get a really good evaluation from either a physical therapist or a, a good golf trainer who knows how to evaluate your stance, but I would lean toward physical therapy so they can look at the muscle imbalances and work with you to try to get you to improve that stance and be more economical in the way you swing. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think as a therapist, our job, and I, the motto was on the screen before, champions of yes. And our job is not to tell you to stop doing the things you love to do, but it's to help you get back to doing the things you love to do and work on strategies and, and adaptations that are necessary to get you there. And Nima, what do you think as far as, you know, even patients post-operatively, if they're coming off of shoulder surgery, you know, returning to the, the exercises that they love to do or the, the activities they love to do in that sense? That's a great question, Hunter. Thanks for having me on, by the way. Um, so post-op, you know, it's just, it's just a, it's a staging process, right? We have excellent therapists who do so much work after the, after the surgery, for example, a shoulder replacement. What ends up happening is we first have to work on motion and then we have to work on some strength. Right. And then we work on sports specific exercises. It goes back to, you know, we crawl before we stand, before we walk. And it's the same thing in anything we do. Um, so when it comes to golf, we actually, uh, my group actually wrote out a, a paper on um, golf and tennis uh, after shoulder replacements. So we have kind of like timelines for that. It gives people an idea, but we always have to remember that timelines are different for every patient and there's no specific timeline. You'll be back. It depends on how well you're doing and how you're responding. So if people are doing well and they're pain-free at the stage they're in, they, they take a step on the, on the ladder, go a step higher and go to the next stage. And we slowly progress them. And the goal is to never go zero to 60 and get you back to pain-free acti activities. Seems like a unanimous vote here that you should not quit certain activities and that you should, you know, use appropriate progression towards return. There's a lot of options out there. Don't give up on your golf, whoever that one was from. Okay, another one here. This is under our hand category. Gary, this one's coming to you. Okay, the question is, is carpal tunnel a form of arthritis and how can I prevent pain from it? Sure, and you brought up before that there's different reasons for pain and carpal tunnel is a compressed nerve. So it's not a form of arthritis, it's different. It's a, it's a nerve which is compressed going through what's called the carpal tunnel of your wrist or right at the crease of your wrist. Um, can inflammation and other issues of joint inflammation increase pressure in that area and, and possibly start to cause pressure on the nerve? The answer to that is yes, um, especially the more traumatic forms of arthritis, but arthritis and carpal tunnel are separate entities. As far as for treatment of carpal tunnel, typically the, the conservative treatment is wearing a brace at night with your wrist nice and straight. 
um, and trying to relieve the symptoms. But I always urge people not to wait too long to, to seek um, to see a hand surgeon about a carpal tunnel issue because then the muscles can atrophy and the problem can get worse. So if the symptoms are getting worse, that, that you should seek help quickly. Marsha, any other thoughts about treatment for carpal tunnel from a therapy standpoint? Uh, no, I completely agree with that. Um, I think a therapist can also help you look at what you're doing in your mechanics to determine where you're putting um, stress on your wrist. So for instance, if you've, you're doing activities at the computer and you're lined up so you're in wrist extension all the time, we know that the carpal tunnel is its most open when the hand is in neutral. And so being able to look at those positions and um, change your activities in order to maintain as close to neutral as possible in order to keep that tunnel as open as much as you can. However, if after um, a, a short time of trying these conservative measures, if you find that it's getting worse, I totally agree with Gary, it's time to seek uh, additional help from a, a hand surgeon. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get hand surgery but it does mean that they need to evaluate the nerve a little bit more, do a few more tests. And there are a few other conservative steps that could be done prior to surgery. And I think so we the, have a, sorry. I'm sorry, Gary, go ahead. No, just one more thing with the highest risk activities, which are the most provocative as Marcia said, are prolonged positions. You're with the wrist all the way back or all the way down, as well as forceful movements or things that have a, vi a vibratory component to it. So if you're doing a lot of forceful vibrates, vibratory stuff, mowing your lawn and you're getting symptoms or working with a lot of tools with vibration, that those can definitely be causes to look at as well. And we have a rebuttal question here that's come in on the live chat and I'll ping this over to you, Dr. Moran. It said, are pain and grinding noises a sign of carpal tunnel or osteoarthritis? So, you know, it, when we talk about noises, we always have to be a little bit careful because you can have cracking and, and noises and it can be completely normal. Most of our joints make sounds. So it could be, you have to remember it can be normal, but with arthritis, uh, when you have grinding and you hear more, more noises than normal, it's possible that you're getting to uh, later stages of arthritis. More important than the noises is your motion. So when you start to lose motion, and particularly we're talking about upper extremities, so let's talk about the shoulder. You're, if you lose, start to use, uh, lose external uh, motion, external range of motion, meaning if I, I'll stand up for a second, I'm not able to go out like this and reach behind me. If you're grabbing a purse or a bag in the back, you know, backseat of the car while you're driving, those kind of motion losses can, can tell you that you know, your arthritis is getting worse. That's one of the examples. But in general, just uh, try to, uh, if you haven't had an injury, or don't have a diagnosis, don't assume that noises are bad. And, you know, I'll just add to that as well. I think, you know, a lot of times um, I have patients come into the office and they're saying, look, look at my MRI or look at my, my images and look how bad they are. Um, but to your point, Nima, their function is actually relatively maintained and they're, they're relatively active. And a lot of times I think as practitioners, you know, we try to educate people on not judging a patient by their images right? And, and sticking more towards function, which to your point, I think is, you know, what we all try to do. And so just because something's cracking doesn't mean it's an issue. Just because you have that on an MRI doesn't mean that's the issue. Um, it's, it's looking at the overall clinical picture and each patient's clinical scenario. So I we have another kind of- that, man. I think you nailed that. All right. Here's another, here's another, uh, you know, it's sidebar question here coming in. It says, Thoughts on total body vibrational therapy. Uh, let's stick this in the therapy uh, realm here as far as total body vibrational therapy and any effects on arthritis or joint disease in that sense. Marsha, why don't we kick it off with you? Okay, so um, I'm going to base this on a clinical practice guideline that was published um, in 2020 by um, Kolosinski, where they reviewed interventions for um, uh, uh, osteoarthritis primarily, and they found absolutely uh, no studies or evidence to really support that intervention for osteoarthritis in any of the joints in the body. So um, I have never used that plate, so I can't really tell you from personal experience what I think about it or how it works. But when I think about this, the idea of something just vibrating without really 
any other cause doesn't seem to me that it's going to do much for the joints, just depending on, on what position you're in and which joints we're talking about. If we're talking about the shoulder and you're standing on the plate and you're just vibrating, um, I, I think that may actually make the pain a little bit worse if your ligaments are a little bit short uh, and the joint is a little bit tight. So um, I'm not sure that I can say that I'm in favor of that idea, but I haven't seen any, any studies to support it. Gary, your thoughts on that? I, I, to add, I, that was great, Marsha. I would agree with that. I don't have um, experience with that. Um, it's, I think some people get pain relief from vibration. They call it the gate theory, right? It's another stimulus that may temporarily take over for pain. But as far as the mechanics of it producing any sort of effect or helping, helping in general, I, I haven't seen any evidence to that. So uh, we're getting a lot of questions here coming through the, the stream as well as the pre-screen questions um, about the use of chiropractic care uh, in the management of joint pain. Uh, Dr. Morata, how do you address this if it comes up? I know obviously, you know, you're in more of a, a sports and orthopedic setting, so it may not come up as much, but how do you address, you know, chiropractic care for joint disease in that sense? You know, it's, it's, it's a great question. I, to be honest with you, what I always try to do is I try to check my ego at the door, right? So there are things that I can do and, and there are things that, that I have in my armamentarium where I can help patients. And sometimes I'm not able to help them with some of the, the options that I have. I, I encourage acupuncture. I encourage chiropractors. You know, I encourage physical, physical therapists, uh, occupational therapists to get involved. I think that um, if patients have had good experiences with a chiropractor and they feel like they are, have better alignment, they're, they have better symmetry in, in terms of function, they, they feel better, then I have no qualms about that. You know, we are all here to help one another, make the patient better. And we have a goal and that's their improvement. So whatever, whoever can help with that, that's the best option. Gary, any thoughts on, uh, you know, the addition of chiropractic care in that sense? Not really, as long as there's communication between the professionals that are working on the same patient. Um, it makes it difficult sometimes if you're working on somebody and then sort of at the end they said, oh, and I'm seeing my chiropractor today and they're also working on my shoulder. Um, then we don't know what, if what we're doing is helping, if what they're doing is helping, are they doing the same thing, something different? Are we on the same page or not? So I think it's important just that the team or any, any person community that's um, working with the patient or as part of that care team is in communication with each other so we can understand how best to complement each other rather than um, basically be, be on opposing sides. And Marsha, the same similar sentiments, I'm assuming? Yeah, similar sentiments, but also I'd like to make sure that they're not just getting chiropractic care. So uh, it may be that an adjustment is very helpful, but I'd like to see that um, uh, assisted with some exercises or some activity modification for the patient to follow through at home so that it isn't a passive treatment so much, but that the patient has an active role in following through if there was some success made during an adjustment, then we need to get the structural muscles around it strong enough so that that doesn't have to be a recurrent adjustment every week, but something that the patient is able to maintain based on muscle strength. And I think we can all agree. I mean, we have a physiatrist, an orthopedic surgeon, a physical therapist, and an occupational therapist here that a multimodal approach is likely uh, the best road for success. You know, a lot of times I feel like I I talk with patients and I say, listen, you know, it's taken X amount of years for you to get here. And our job is to find the treatment keystone for you. And it's going to be different and it might be four things, but we got to try, you know, whatever doesn't set you back and what keeps moving the chains forward. And I think, you know, to keep that communication line open, like you said, Gary, is, is super crucial. And obviously you want to incorporate the different exercises, not just the chiropractic care. Okay, let's take a look. What do we have next here? So I have a question here. So actually, Dr. Moran, we're getting a few questions here in regards to shoulder replacement surgery. And one of the questions we have here is, I'm still having pain after my shoulder replacement surgery. Why? 
So that there could be several reasons for that, right? You know, um, the first thing is always managing expectations. What, what, what was life like before surgery? Are you doing better than you are prior to having surgery? If you're still doing, you know, 50, 60% better, that's a good sign. Now, if you're doing worse than prior to surgery and you're uh, several years out, we have to, we have to see a physician. We got to find out what your surgeon thinks. We need x-rays. Sometimes implants can loosen over time. Um, sometimes the plastic can wear down. Uh, sometimes there's other things going on. It's a, ten, it's a tendinous issue. Uh, there's inflammation. Sometimes it's just a physical therapy issue. It's just all you need is to work on some, some strength exercises and that'll improve the problem. Sometimes it's non-surgical at all. So it's just, you need an evaluation, see your surgeon, you know, get some imaging, make sure everything's okay. If they decide it's something non-surgical, they'll probably set you up with a therapist to work on that. And if it's something more concerning, they'll let you know based on, based on their exam and imaging, but don't necessarily, don't worry. Currently shoulder replacements are lasting about 10 years uh, at a 90% success rate uh, or 90, 90 to 93% success rate. So they're doing quite well. They're really improving. So uh, just make sure to just see someone before you, before you get worried. So that's good though. We had another question about the success rate of total shoulder replacement. So 90 to 93% at, at 10 years uh, success rate. So that's, that's pretty good in that sense. Uh, you know, one of the other questions in rebuttal to that was in regards to elbow replacement surgery. Um, do you have any, any statistics or any recommendations as far as the success rate of that and any problems that can come from elbow replacement? So elbow replacements are a little trickier. I don't do elbow replacements. You see them done way less often. You know, when I was in training, I probably was involved in only five or six elbow replacements. The constraint of the elbow is a little bit more complicated. Um, and so what ends up happening is we start to send patients who need elbow replacements to the, the few surgeons who are just doing them regularly because we want to have them have the, to the, sorry, we want them to have the best outcome, right? So my data on that's not great. I don't, I hardly ever read elbow literature anymore unless it's about Tommy John's because I do Tommy John surgery, right? So I don't have the best data. I don't want to give any wrong information. Marsha, in regards to, you know, after total shoulder replacements or total elbows, although they're less common, you know, what do you see from a biomechanical standpoint you know, that's really important for maximizing patient's recovery in that sense? Patience. Patience is the most important thing following Good. these surgeries. The expectation that you're going to be back doing whatever you want at, at three months is not really true. You think about those rehabbing over the course of a full year. And the idea is that it's a gradual improvement based on getting the motion first, as you said previously, and then uh, eventually building up to be able to do strength. Um, I'm, at least for the reverse total shoulder, the expectation is that you really won't be lifting as much weight as you may have been lifting before. I think the last, uh, the last person I had was limited to 15 pounds for a reverse total shoulder replacement. And so going in with realistic expectations and then realizing that you are going to be exercising from now on. It's not, oh, my shoulder's done now and I don't have to worry about this. It's just like brushing your teeth. You are gonna to have to get up every day and you're gonna to have to exercise that shoulder in order to keep it in the best possible uh, function that it can be. And the same goes with the elbow. We have a little lower expectation with the total elbow. We don't expect as much range of motion. Um, what we really want is some functional motion that's pain-free, uh, but you're not gonna be doing planks on that elbow. Um, you're, you're gonna have some limitations, but you will hopefully be more pain-free following that surgery. Oh, that's great. If I can yeah, add one thing to that, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Vincent. Yeah, so one of the, uh, Marsha made some excellent points. The most important thing to know about a total elbow is it's in a, in a low demand population. We're not putting total elbows in patients who are gonna be going to throw a ball, right? We're putting total elbows in patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, are 75 or 80, you know, it's complete degenerative arthritis. And they, they, we're not trying to get them even a lot more motion. We're just trying to get rid of pain. We're trying to solve for pain. Anything they get on top of that is the cherry on top. You know, so it's really important to realize, uh, going back to what she said is it's all about expectations. Yeah, and there's, and there's, a, there's a journey to recovery there. 
right? Those are, those surgeries are, you know, they're big operations and you need to trust in your care team and trust the process and then work appropriately. I think that's great. All right, Gary, we're getting, we're getting blown up here on the chat room about exercises to strengthen hands and wrists. So do you have two or three exercises that you really like for strengthening hands and wrists? Interesting question on, on it, what you're trying to improve with hand or wrist strength. Um, number one, any, any, as far as for wrist, anything that you do, you want to make sure that you're always exercising in a comfortable range. So you're not really stressing the joints and sort of in a mid range of the joint. So not to bring it to the extreme. So you're putting more pressure or torque on the joint. I tell most of my patients who are either post up or recovering, if you're working on strengthening stuff, don't do anything that you can't do 15 times and that you can't do for the rest for a minute and then do another 15 and don't increase until you can do at least 15, maybe three times. So number one is take it slow. Your goal isn't to do these, you know, five repetitions of maximal strength. Um, as far as hand strengthening, you know, we only think of it, it. The question is, is why is the hand weak, right? Is it muscles in the forearm which control the fingers? Are they weak? Is it weakness because they're painful? Um, the best thing to do is, is to resume normal activities gradually. I don't love sitting there squeezing ball, squeezing balls or squeezing clay. They tend to be more stressful on joints. Um, you can gradually do things. You can, you can gradually just increase your activity level or perform more what we call functional strengthening, like use common objects and manipulate them and raise them up and down. But, um, there aren't great grip ones. As far as, um, work working on if it's pinch strength like you're having trouble opening bottles and and cans and stuff there's actually a muscle which i like to point out to people when you lift your index finger up there's a muscle that kind of pops out which get and that sort of stabilizes the base of the thumb for you so i encourage people to work on sort of lifting that up and bringing the thumb across and even resisting that a little bit to try to strengthen and stabilize the base of the thumb which is a very very common area of arthritis and sometimes people mistake the pain for actual weakness of the muscles. Got it. And then the, you know, the rebuttal question here that's, that's trickling in is, can these exercises slow the progression of osteoarthritis? The answer is some. If you're trying to stabilize a joint like the one I just mentioned, that can help. Um, but as far as motion, the, the expression sort of motion is lotion. You want to do a lot of movement. You want to do a lot of non-resistive movement. I think in the beginning, the walking, the swimming, the whole body type activities, but stressful, repetitious, heavy exercise is, is more contraindicated, but you want things that you can do to gradually build up. It's a slow process. Um, keeping healthy will help you avoid the um, negative effects of arthritis. It doesn't cure it, but it can certainly help. Gotcha. Marsha, any, uh, any other comments on things that you like from hand and wrist strengthening in that standpoint? Yeah, I agree with everything Gary said. And some of the patients that I see feel like their hand is weak when in reality it's their shoulder or their elbow. And they are trying to substitute their hand for larger, stronger joints that should be doing the activity. And so I always tend to look uh, a little more proximal or a little more up when patients are complaining about that weakness. We know that wrist uh, being able to stabilize or co-contract the muscles around your wrist in order to lock it when you go to grip is really important. So wrist strength, uh, strengthening the wrist muscles, I think really does improve the hand grip um, quite a bit. Then looking at making sure that the shoulder is strong and the elbow is strong and that they're using those proximal muscles because the hand muscles and wrist muscles are really there for finesse. You know, those are your, your dexterity muscles and those are your fine motor muscles. And they're not always your brute strength muscles. So uh, being able to make sure that you're strong in proximal joints would be what I would add. And you know, one of the other, the questions that's come in after that is, does it, do these exercises prevent hand deformity? You know, and as I listen to you, you know, you both speak, there's an emphasis on function and maintaining function, right? Because our hands are so important to just all of our activities of daily living and, and living our life and doing the things that we like to do. Um, but in regards to preventing the hand deformity, you know, or, or the progression of the disease, not necessarily the case. That's correct. Some of the thumb stabilization ones, if you're, it's a 
your acting is sort of a dynamic stabilizer, so using the muscles to stabilize the joint, but it depends what the deformity is that you're, you know, what the action is on the deformity. But um, on most of them, they'll exercise in, a, in and of itself a lot of times is not gonna prevent deformity. So I'm gonna jump in there too. Um, for RA, I mean, for uh, osteoarthritis, um, the joints that tend to be the most um, quote unquote deformed are the tip joints on the ends of the fingers. And how fast those change depend on the stresses that you're putting into those joints as you do things. So if you're doing a lot of pushing and scrubbing and poking and tearing at Velcro, you're really straining those DIP joints and that may um, make that deformity happen a little faster. There are also genetic components um, in this disease and it's really hard for us to predict who's gonna progress on to having uh, joint deformities and who isn't. And so Great there's point. a little bit of a genetic factor, but also there's uh, the idea of limiting where you put the stress on your joints. Don't tear open packages in your kitchen. I have a, a pair of spring opening scissors and everything gets open with those spring opening scissors because I don't have to use any joints to tear those open. Um, you know, changing how you do things and looking at what can I do to make this easier so that the tips of my fingers are putting that force there. Um, Ziploc bags, Velcro, all of those things are really high um, deforming forces on the tips of our fingers. And so looking at what else can we do to decrease the stresses. Those are good recommendations. I like those. I think uh, a lot of the patients on the webinar right now writing those down. That's for sure. Maybe I'll have to go get a pair of spring loaded scissors as myself. Um, so then the, the other question is, you know, are there certain modalities that you like to use uh, in your therapy, whether that's ice or heat, and which one do you find works best? This is a common one that I feel like yeah. I get all the time. You know, usually for, if it's an acute onset, like somebody came in and it's, someone's acutely flared and everything feels hot, then usually something cold helps it calm down. But most people, if they're complaining of the general achiness, the general stiffness, um, they tend to prefer heat modalities and that tends to help loosen the joint. Um, no warm, not hot, and no more than 10 minutes at a time. Um, some people really like the home paraffin baths, mm -hmm. which are available at stores just to use it if they have a lot of hand paint at night and that settles it down. Um, but typically warm modalities help more with stiffness and more with that aching type pain and cold really helps with the, an acute onset pain. Like I just overdid something. I know I shouldn't have done that gardening and I came in the house before it and it's starting to flare up, that's a great time to put a cold pack on and let and that will help mitigate the um, inflammatory process a little bit. Nima, what are your thoughts on ice versus heat? So I agree with Gary. I think, you know, when we think about ice versus heat, when someone has an acute inflammation, you definitely want to use ice. Over joints, you generally want to use ice if someone has an injury or inflammation. Uh, you want to decrease the inflammation. There's some evidence that it helps with mobility. Uh, decreasing in inflammation. Now, if someone has stiffness, muscle tightness, yeah, you know, taking a warm bath or using heater are great because they will loosen up, their joints loosen up, their muscles loosen up. But I always tell patients who are using heat to use ice after they do their exercises. Because what I want to make sure is that after they're doing their exercises, you know, the heat can cause vasodilation, right? I don't want them to increase their swelling as a result of the heat. So I say, if you use heat, that's cool. Just make sure after you're done, you're doing your exercises to keep your mobility. Now let's ice the joint. So that's, that's my general rule. Combo approach. I like that. All right. So switching over here to sleeping techniques. All right. My shoulder bothers me when I have, when I'm sleeping, any tips for better sleep with shoulder pain? Sure. Yeah, that's a, common one. That, that's a very common one. Um, what happens when you fall asleep, you know, when you're laying there before you go to sleep, your, your, your muscles are still controlling your shoulder. And then you fall asleep and the muscles stop working and all of a sudden you're sort of hanging on your shoulder. And we talked about postural issues before with forward shoulders. And the other thing with shoulders, if it's right next to your side, you're actually compressing the blood flow a little bit to the shoulder. So a couple of things that we recommend is rolling up a towel putting a pillow under the armpit and having a little support behind if you're laying on your back so the shoulder doesn't kind of fall back on you just so it's a little bit more controlled and it's a little bit more open and that typically helps people sleep a little bit better. 
That's a good one. Do you, do you use a beach towel or do you use a hand towel? Do you have a it, recommendation? Something that, that? Has enough, uh, something that has enough thickness rolled up to just keep a little bit of space between the arm. Gotcha. And if you roll it up and tape it closed, then, then it's a little bit more of a bolster. Okay. Marsha, what do you got? Any tips or tricks? So in addition to, if you can't sleep on your back and you just say, I can't do that, it's just impossible then sleeping on the unaffected side with a pillow in front of you so that the arm doesn't fall forward in front of you as you're laying on that side, but rather it's supported a little bit out to the side, which aligns the, the shoulder joint a little bit more where it should be. And again, keeps it from that forward rotation or falling forward, which puts a lot of strain on the posterior uh, part of the cuff. Um, if you absolutely want to sleep on the painful side, some suggestions are, you can take large pillows and put them between your hips and your rib cage so that you're kind of lifting yourself up a little bit and you're unweighting that joint just a little bit. And that may improve your pain, but if you do that, then you also need to increase the size of the, of the head pillow because you need to raise that up so that your head is not off to one side. I think in all of these positions, you need to make sure that you've got your neck in a nice neutral position, which means it's not cocked back, looking at this way back at the ceiling and the headboard, but it's not pushed too far forward because you've been looking at your Kindle before you fell asleep. For all of those, you really need to have your, your neck as neutral as possible because those muscles really affect the shoulder. And so it's all connected and making sure that you, you're in good alignment when you sleep. Definitely. All right, Nima, we have a question coming in from Beverly here, specifically for you. And it says, can you explain what a reverse shoulder replacement is? Oh, I wish I had one in my office right now. I don't have my model, but uh, so the difference between a total shoulder and a reverse shoulder is we switch the location of the ball in the socket. So if you think of a shoulder joint, you have your ball and then you have your socket, right? It's a ball and socket joint. Now, when we replace on a total shoulder, we cut the neck and we put an implant that has a ball that's uh, convex into a concave socket. That's, that's, that's standard, but that means to be able to do that, all the tendons around the shoulder are normal. Your rotator cuff tendons are intact, allowing you to move your shoulder. Now, what the reverse shoulder does, which is was actually really brilliant, is they switch the positions. So the socket now becomes the ball, and it's like that. It's you know, it's it's uh, convex, and on the on the actual shoulder joint, we take out, we cut off the neck again, but we put an implant in that's concave. So now the socket's like this, and the shoulder's like this, and it allows you to lever up when you don't have a rotator cuff tendon to get your arm up in the air. Uh, it, it actually, you know, the reverse is becoming more and more placed. Uh, it's becoming the more popular shoulder replacement to do. It's a little bit forgiving and it allows for a lot of patients who are actually tearing their rotator cuff later on when they have uh, you know, an original total shoulder. Uh, anybody who has like a partial tear and things like that, it gives them the, the confidence to know that their shoulder is still gonna work if they have a problem in the future. But it just depends on, on, on who you are and what's going on with your shoulder. You just need a good exam and some good imaging and we can figure out what the better option is. Great explanation, hopefully that Took care of it for you there, Beverly. All right, coming back to our therapy side here. Question is, do braces or rather taping make a difference in hand OA? So do you guys okay. utilize taping or, or kinesio tape in that sense? Um, I'm gonna jump in on the taping side and um, there is um, some evidence to show that kinesio taping can help for osteoarthritis at the base of the thumb. Usually it's osteoarthritis that hasn't progressed very far. And this is a there is a taping technique that can help to offset the joint a little bit. It gives you a little bit of sensory feedback and a little bit of uh, assist into getting the thumb up and back out of the hand. Um, we haven't seen any evidence to support the use of kinesio tape in any of the other uh, finger joints. Um, for uh, osteoarthritis. Now in sports, certainly for climbing and gymnasts, um, they use athletic tape to help support 
uh, some of the joints in order to give stability to those joints. And I'm not aware of any evidence that's looked at that in osteoarthritis, but I certainly am aware of it in, in mountain climbers and in gymnasts to try to give some support, particularly to the pulleys um, on the first part of the finger. Have you ever used the kinesio taping for biomechanical cues or anything as far as scapular kinesia and things like or scapular movement? Absolutely. So not in the hand, but obviously up in the shoulder blade. Um, it really helps people to become aware of the position of their shoulder blade and mechanics of their shoulder blade so that they can get into a much more healthy movement pattern. So I yes, I think it's very effective for yeah. that. And I think it's effective there too. We, you know, the things that we can do, we can't, we don't have the types of braces necessarily for a hand or a finger that we, I mean, for a shoulder that we could use for a hand. Um, I think the types of orthoses, the splints that we have, there's rigid ones and non-rigid ones. And you really have to be evaluated for what's gonna work best for you. Um, the soft ones do a nice job of mitigating pain. Um, people use them a lot for function. The more rigid ones, if they're molded well, can actually hold the joint in a better position and allow you to do things with better biomechanics um, and stabilize the thumb more. So you have to figure out what you need it for and, and what activities work best with what. Um, the other thing to figure out is whether you, what joints you need in it, because a lot of people with OA at the base of their thumb, this part, the empty joint of their thumb hyperextends. The joint sort of collapses down here and they get this kind of deformity with the thumb hyperextending. If you have that, you definitely want something to hold that joint down. Otherwise the biomechanics of it, when you pinch, puts more force at the base of the, um, at the, base of the thumb. So this, the braces help a lot with people for function. And I have people who come back and four years later, they just need a new one or it refurbished um, because they do tend to use them and use them for a long time. But you have to find the one that's right for you, whether it's a soft one, a hard one, um, it should be well-made if it is a custom one and to make sure that it's really in a good position for you to do the activities that you're having difficulty doing. Yeah, and I think, you know, just to kind of sum all of that up, it's, it's important for patients to realize that the, it's a unique solution for each individual right. and that it's not necessarily a one size fits all. And so, you know, always recommended to seek therapy advice or physician advice as far as the one that is needed for you and for your specific joint that is painful. Because again, the topic of this, while it's the arthritis foundation, we're looking at all kinds of musculoskeletal pain. And there can be a lot of other reasons for why you're having pain in and around the joint of the thumb or in the hands or the shoulder. So, you know, maybe kinesio taping or taping or bracing may not be the solution. Maybe there's something else. And so having a proper evaluation is crucial in that sense. So one of the most common questions that's been coming through and, and the one that I'm sure you answer five times a day is which topical do you recommend and, or, or do you? And why don't we start with you, Nima? So the one that I recommend the most, uh, one of the more popular ones is Voltaren. Um, it works for some people. I think that Voltaren, which is just for those who don't know, it's basically a topical anti-inflammatory. It's known as diclofenac. It's similar to like an ibuprofen or an Aleve or an Advil. And I think it works for some people in areas where they have very little soft tissue, you know, uh, around the ankles, you know, some parts of the hand, uh, some parts of the shoulder, they'll say find the knee, but in places where you have a lot more cushion, it's not going to be that great. Um, but that's usually my go-to and it just depends on the patient. I also talk about, um, you know, you know, using, um, turmeric as a, as an anti-inflammatory orally. So those are just as, as something, if they want non, non-medical, like, you know, more Eastern, non-Western medicine. Marsha, what are your thoughts on topicals? So um, I think of them like wrinkle creams in some cases. Um, the NSAIDs have been shown, topical NSAIDs have been shown to be helpful. However, on your hand, you're washing your hand all the time, which means you've got to reapply it all the time. And it makes it a little bit impractical for during the day. But um, there's so many uh, out there on the market. It, it's kind of like a wrinkle cream. If it's... Uh, Within my budget, and I'm out of what I'm using, I might give it a try. Now, I know in my heart I'm not going to look like Eva Longoria if I use this cream, but I might look a little bit better for a little, for a little what. And so it might help me a little bit, and as long as it doesn't hurt me um, and I don't break out from it, that's great. 
Um, will it change what's going on? Probably not. And my one worry about, about using them if they're going to numb your hand is that you may overexercise because pain does something to protect us as well. And it tells us, hey, you're doing too much. And so, you know, I always caution people about uh, using some of these things that may numb them and say, you know, it may allow you to do more than you really realize you're doing. And so I, I would use them with extreme caution. Gary, your thoughts on topicals in that I, sense? I do see so a lot of people um, that, that use Voltaren and, and you know, there's a some people love it. Some people, it, I, I agree with the consensus that some people love it. Some people it does nothing for. Um, yeah, people try a lot of the different creams and stuff. Sometimes they, I'll say, you know, just use it if you're having, if this, I went to use it. Maybe after, like Marcia said, I don't want it to do it before a treatment session, but after, if you're having a lot of pain, if it helps you, if it makes you feel a little bit better, go ahead. It's certainly not hurting anything as long as you don't have a reaction to it. And if, if it seems to help your pain a little bit, then that's fine. Go ahead and use it. I don't really have a favorite. I know some people love Biofreeze is another one that's just kind of a hot cold, but a lot of those ones that feel cold and then feel warm people like as well. And I think in that same vein too, you know, one of the questions that at least I deal with on a daily basis is what are your thoughts on CBD topicals? or CBD creams. Obviously those are very popular right now and there's a lot of different products hitting the market. And I think at the same, you know, the same conversation that I have with patients is it's about understanding the risk to benefit ratio. And if it gives, if it provides you with benefit, whether that is the CBD itself, or if that is the other components that are in the topical, whether that's, you know, menthol, menthol, methyl salicylate, uh, capsaicin, lidocaine, whatever else there is, um, then that's fine. If it's causing skin irritation or it's causing more harm than good, then I say that's, that's not good. That's not part of that keystone for your return to function in that sense. Um, but that in that same, you know, grouping of, you know, topicals, a lot of times, and to your point, NEMA comes uh, supplements to help with joint pain. And so one of the questions we have here is, you know, supplements to help degeneration and pain. What are your thoughts on glucosamine? So it's funny because back in the day, you know, when I was early in residency and training, you know, glucosamine was super popular. It was, hey, let's let's try this. And then a, a several randomized control trials came out, particularly about knee arthritis um, and how, how does it do uh, glucosamine and conjoint sulfate. And the American Academy of Orthopedics came out and said, basically, don't take it. It doesn't do anything for you. It's there. We have no good evidence on it. So patients come to me and they bring it up and they say, hey, I'm taking it. I feel like it works. Then I say, take it. If you feel like there's no harm in this, if you feel like this is helping you, whether it's a placebo effect or not, take it, right? It's, we, know, we know it's not harmful. We just know based on a randomized control trial that it doesn't have a much more different of an effect than the placebo. However, if it helps you, great. And if it doesn't help you, well, then let's not waste the money because if you don't notice a difference, I don't want you wasting the money on something where we have evidence that it's not super helpful. Is there a recommended time that you, you know, if patients want to try it, you say, Hey, you should try it for X amount of weeks or whatnot. Yeah. I usually, I, I usually with, with anything like a vitamin or, you know, anything that's a, a healthy supplement, that's not going to cause any problems. I say try it for a couple months. Now there's no yeah. science behind that. That's just me saying, you know, give it, give it, give it the old college try. And that's about it. Yeah. I feel like I, I usually recommend about three months just because I feel like you hit a, a steady state where you're at least going to see the Delta over time. But so then, you know, the other question that we get a lot in regards to joint pain management is what are your thoughts on corticosteroids and steroid injections into the joints? And I'm sure that you see, see them in clinic and then you, you know, see the afterthought or whatever, where they go to surgery. So what are your thoughts on steroids into the joints? So I think um, I actually have made a couple of videos on this before. I think steroids uh, play an important role in, in, in our healthcare system. People hear all these things about them and they say it's going to destroy your joint or it's going to, you know, uh, kill your cartilage or, you know, uh, your tendons are going to, you know, erupt. You know, things, the, the things I hear all the time, it's, it's pretty crazy, but they play a very important role. We got to remember that oral steroids are systemic and they go all throughout your body. And those are much more powerful than a local steroid. Yes, they have, you know, pros and cons, but when you have a degenerative joint and you're 70 years old and we're in a situation where we may be able to delay or avoid surgery because 
you know, you get one or two steroid injections a year, it sounds like a pretty reasonable thing. Um, and, and if you're someone who's 25 or 30, giving you steroid shots doesn't make very much sense. Uh, you know, because that, that just sounds like a Band-Aid, right? So for people with degenerative joint disease, I think steroids are a good option. Now it depends where. Um, and so in the shoulder and the knee, they do quite well. In the hand, a lot of hand surgeons you speak to, they're not huge fans of them anymore. They don't seem to last very long. Uh, it's a very small joint. It's very hard to get it in, guarantee that it's in and you're giving them enough. So, um, you know, for them, they, they, they're not, they, they do it, and if it if it's worked, but if it doesn't work after one try, they don't really do it too often. Uh, that's probably what I'd say. And the, the major risk that you really should be concerned about for a steroid injection, the infection risk runs between one in 10,000 to 50,000. So very low. Um, there's a small chance that your, your skin can blanch where, an inje where the injection goes in. So if you have darker skin, it can become more white, right? Um, there is a, there's a small chance that your, if you have diabetes, your blood sugar can go up. So that's a concern. These are real concerns, but the concern that you have one steroid injection and all of a sudden it's going to erode your joint, that's not possible. And remember, we're usually giving these to people who have eroded joints, right? They have degenerative joints. We're not giving it to people who have perfectly healthy joints. And the other, you know, to your point as well, they serve a very, a very good diagnostic tool, right? You know, as far as differentiating between joint disease and bursitis and tendinopathy and things like that, it can be used by your clinician and your practitioner to really tease out, well, where is your pain coming from? Because they can work, you know, quickly and immediately for, you know, for the most part, you know, typically takes about, you know, three to five days for the steroid to take effect, but it can be a, a great diagnostic tool. So, you know, yes, there is a, some developing research which is suggesting that it can progress arthritis. Now, to your point, Nemo, over time, not if you're getting, you know, one or two a year, but it's a great diagnostic tool. And so definitely something to consider. Hunter, I'm so glad you brought that up. Imagine if a doctor gives you an injection in your hand or your elbow and you get no relief. That tells you that that may not be the problem. And it could be yep. from like what Marcia said earlier, up the chain. Maybe you have a, a pinched nerve in your neck. So that's, it's a huge diagnostic tool. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And you know, it's again, back to the theme of everything that we're trying to talk about here is it's not so simple, right? A lot of times there's five things going on or five other things that could be going on. And it's really important for, you know, everyone listening and all the, the arthritis foundation to kind of understand it. It may not be just the joint pain. It may be something else as well. So what do we have here? What's coming through on the chains? Okay, this one's for you, Marsha. This is right up your alley. It says, push-ups and weight training with shoulder osteoarthritis. Any advice? So my question back would be, are you having pain when you do it? And why are you doing it? Are you trying to strengthen specific muscles or are you just wanting to do it because you want to do it? Um, the question is, uh, whether or not it's painful. If it's painful, there are other ways to strengthen those muscles that aren't weight bearing. Um, the other thing I'd wanna look at is the core strength and stability. Um, do you have strong enough core strength to really take a lot of the load off the, off the uh, shoulder as you're doing those particular exercises? So I can't say without seeing the patient and evaluating them and looking at where their pain is and where their muscle imbalances are, whether that's a great idea or not a great idea. But if you're doing it and it hurts, um, I would vote no. All right, Gary, if, if it, so for Marsha, we have, if it hurts, don't do it, which I think is always the, a great recommendation. I think I would join in on that. And the other thing is remember, if it does hurt, the reason why it probably hurts, if it does hurt, if you have an arthritic shoulder is that you're bringing the two surfaces closer together and, and the, the two arthritic surfaces closer together. And that's probably what's causing more pain and, and can cause a little bit more problems. So yeah, if it's hurting, if you're, if you're having more symptoms when you're doing those, then definitely not find another way to strengthen. Yeah, there are other ways to strengthen those muscles that are not going to be compressive and weight bearing um, exercises. Yeah, and you know, I sometimes I have patients, you know, that I offer therapy to, and they say, you know, I'm good. I got this figured out. I, you know, I, I've done it. I've done a ton of therapy. And to your point exactly right here, it's you do this for a living. You are not only extremely educated, but also very creative. And there's 
you know, a lot of different ways to slice the apple. And so you can work around it and you can modify activities, you know, to kind of fit each individual's needs. That's the, the benefit of having a trained professional on your side, right? All right, so now our chat room is taking us back to corticosteroids. If it's the only thing that helps with pain, is it worth the risk of side effects? Nima, let's ping that over to you. Again, it depends on the, the patient. What, what's your age? Why are we doing it? I don't inject corticosteroids into tendons. I do them generally for my practice. I do them for knee joints and shoulder joints, and I do them in arthritic patients. If a patient has a full thickness rotator cuff tear, I fix the rotator cuff tendon. I don't just inject a steroid. But if there's someone who has degenerative joint disease and they've tried anti-inflammatories, <clears throat> both, um, both uh, medicinal and uh, you know, like things like turmeric, if they've tried physical therapy, if they've tried you know, weight loss and all these things haven't, haven't worked out, well, my next step is let's try an injection. Let's see how that does. Because again, it's both diagnostic and therapeutic. And then if that does well, maybe you can now go back to physical therapy because maybe your pain was limiting you. And let's have physical therapy work with you some more. Let's get some nutrition uh, consultations and let's work on weight loss and then come back. I want surgery to be the last option. One of my mentors said the best thing ever about, about uh, patients who have arthritis. He said, I don't tell you when you have surgery, you tell me, because this is not cancer. You don't need this surgery. It's an elective surgery. You tell us because you've tried everything else. You're at your last step and hey, there's nothing else that's worked, but let's try everything first. I love, I love that. And I think that's, you know, that's a good motto, certainly for a surgeon to have. That's a great one. You know, and I think the other thing too is, is what are the side effects? You know, everybody has different, different reactivity to the side effects. If the side effects are very severe um, and you're, you know, you're having significant problems controlling your blood sugar, or you're having, you know, severe, you know, fat atrophy or skin depigmentation or things like that, you know, I think those side effects need to be considered not only by, by you as the individual, but also as the physician, you know, and so, you know, definitely important to have those conversations or at least more advanced conversations with your doc and all the other medical history taken into account. All right. So here's one here for you, Marsha. Question is, I have shoulder bursitis. Is bursitis related to some type, some type of arthritis? So uh, shoulder bursitis means that there's uh, an inflammation in sort of the, the sac or that is underneath the acromion, which is the corner of your shoulder. And there's a tendon that goes underneath it. And there are a number of reasons why that um, particular tissue can become inflamed, but usually it's overhead motion, repetitive motion um, that, that tends to kick it up and make it uncomfortable. Now, it could be that you have a chromioclavicular arthritis that's pushing on the, on the bursa, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the arthritis. They're really two different things, but they can occur together. Got it. All right, Gary, question to you. It says, does arthritis cause trigger finger? And if so, how can I prevent it? So again, we're differentiating between a tendon problem and a joint problem. Um, trigger finger is a tendon and a pulley problem. There's little pulleys which keep the rope, the tendon basically up against the bone. And basically it can become inflamed and thickened and your finger can catch when you close it and, and and basically you get pain in your palm and catching of your finger when you open and close it. Um, so no, it's not a cause for osteoarthritis. With rheumatoid arthritis, you can get inflammation of the, the sheath, the tendon sheath, so it gets more thick and then the finger can start catching. So it's related, but again, it's a tendon problem and not a joint problem, but very com much more common probably in rheumatoid than um, in osteo. Got yeah, we Good. We also see it in, in people who are diabetic and people with gout. People so with they have a, a, higher, a, a higher incidence of trigger finger. So that can contribute. Gotcha. So again, important to differentiate the different diagnoses going on uh, in the hands and with tendons and joints and things like that. Uh, Nemo, you got things fired up here on the uh, chat with your discussion about turmeric. Um, how do you typically bring that up with patients as far as, you know, is there a dose that you recommend or a timing or scheduling, things like that? 
or when, you know, when to best seek that out as an option? So I, um, I be kind of read patients and I discuss with them what they're into. You know, you don't want to, you want to coach patients in a way that they're going to follow the advice. If you meet someone who's very holistic and they don't ever want to take ibuprofen, you have to have an alternative. So I, I discuss that with them. I talk about them using it in their, in their cooking, you know, cause you know, it's, it's something that it's, it's a natural, a natural substance that you can cook with. So why not? You don't have to worry about taking too much. And so I talk to them about that. I talk about taking the over-the-counter pills if they like it um, and see how it, how it impacts them. And a lot of the patients feel like it may, it, it's, it's, an, it's a big improvement. So if it works, you can figure out what you need in terms of your daily dose and, and all that. Um, I don't get into dosing with them. Uh, I also bring up before surgery, though, I want them to stop using it because it does increase, increase bleeding just like NSAIDs do, anti-inflammatories. And so I don't want them taking it within the first week, within a week of surgery. But those are the two times I discussed it. And that's important to consider as well. It's definitely something to consider uh, for spine procedures as well, any kind of epidurals and, and things like that because of the increased bleeding risk. Uh, so always, you know, it's important for patients to discuss all the supplements and herbal uh, minerals and things like that that they're on because they may have hidden risks when it comes to bleeding and things like that. Um, all right, this one's going out to all of us again uh, in regards to sleeping position. So we, there were some good tips for sleeping position for shoulder pain, best sleeping position for back and neck pain. I find patients that sleep on their back are better people all around. I personally cannot sleep on my back. I am a stomach sleeper and I've been living with the consequences ever since, but I'll let you, I always recommend if you can sleep on your back and sleep like this, you're probably going to be better from neck and back standpoint. Marsha, what are your thoughts on that? So it depends on where in the back. There you go. So if, yep. it's, if it's thoracic spine, if it's lumbar spine, or, or if it's neck. So, you know, there are different sections of the back that work differently. So it kind of depends on that. But if it's the lower back, I would say um, sleeping on your back with the pillows uh, under your arm, like we discussed before, to put your shoulders in better position, and then possibly something under your knees in order to kind of keep your hips flexed a little bit, which may help you keep your low back a little bit more on the, on the mattress. Um, if it is your neck, then again, we want to make sure that you've got a good solid pillow under your neck and that your neck is in as neutral a position as possible. And sometimes that may be that you need to put towel rolls on either side of your head so that you don't end up getting off to the side or, or uh, you know, imbalanced somehow when you're sleeping, which ends up getting you sore when you wake up in the morning. So that would be my best advice. As someone who's had L4, L5 disc herniation, the, the laying on your back with the pillows on under your knees is extremely helpful. <laughs> Nima, you a back sleeper? You a stomach sleeper? I'm a back sleeper, but that's also why I snore so loud and my wife hates me. <laughs> <laughs> but I All right, agree with so the that's, rest. The, uh, that's the other risk. Got it. <laughs> All right. So it seems like back and pillows are effective or can be effective for some patients with back pain and osteoarthritis in that sense. Uh, also, the rolled towel seems to be a good technique for shoulder arthritis. So also some, you know, some good stuff there. So naturally one of the other questions that has come through is, you know, what do we think as a panel as far as stem cell procedures for osteoarthritis? And so I can kind of kick this off. You know, one of the things that I like to do in my practice is, you know, be an early adopter of some of the, you know, different orthobiologic treatments for joint disease. And you know, as I have found, there can be an appropriate use and there's an appropriate time to try these. And it definitely is a patient by patient basis. And it depends on, you know, where the patient is as far as not only the chronicity and severity of the joint disease, um, but also what they have tried and how compliant they are with some of the other multimodal approaches, right? Which goes into that kind of multidisciplinary care team, you know, something, you know, stem cell in general, I've, is a bit of a misnomer because even you know stem cell injections out there 
you know, have had and have been proven to have very low populations of stem cells. You know, if anything, it's a growth factor injection. Um, and there are multiple variants of that. The most common being P plate PRP or platelet rich plasma, which is derived from your blood. Uh, and that uses the growth factors and platelets within your blood to, in a sense, change the inflammatory environment or the environment of the knee or the shoulder or whatnot. And so there can be a role and it can be effective and the research is growing, although it's most certainly not uh, of volume yet. Nima, what are your thoughts on it? I totally agree with you. In orthopedics right now, we've, we've had a lot more randomized control trials coming out on uh, PRP, which you mentioned. Stem cells, not as much. I mean, we have, we have both, but PRP has a lot more evidence. And there's, there's been success against placebo and cortisone injection, as well as hyaluronic acid, which you may hear is like the rooster injection, some patients will call it. It's a lubrication. Um, there's been uh, studies on, on PRP versus all those in the knee. And PRP for mild to moderate arthritis has been shown to be successful at one year and more successful than those. Um, and it's also been very helpful for tennis elbow. So when we think about lateral epicondylitis, we've found that PRP injections are very helpful. What I tell patients when it comes to PRP is if you've tried other things, if you can afford it, we know it's not going to harm you. There is a good op it's a, it could be a good option for people with, with knee or shoulder arthritis that's mild to moderate. It could be a good option for people who have tennis elbow or partial tendon tears because we can increase blood flow. That's the, how I think of it in my head. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a great way to kind of break it down. And I think in the ultimate situation, in the ultimate environment is there's, there's collaboration between you know, someone like myself who is specialized in more non-surgical approaches and a surgeon, because then it's saying, listen, you know, this person is more in the severe or has more of a severe tear you know, I think you need to go see, you know, Dr. Moran and, and see if there's, you know, maybe a more, you know, intense approach or a more, a stronger intervention that might be more applicable in this situation. Marsha and, and Gary, have you ever done any sort of rehab post biologic therapy or post PRP? I, I see PRPs mostly with tennis elbow. Um, it's becoming more and more common. Um, it's interesting because it, it sort of started and people were early adopters and it wasn't as widely. And all of a sudden recently, I'm seeing it a lot more and more evidence came out and um, as far as its success with tennis level. So I am seeing it more, more used with that and with some good success actually. Yeah, I have to agree with that. That's um, pretty much what I've seen too. We don't really change the rehab after that. I mean, we still do the same things that we try to do with tennis elbow in terms of strengthening the tissues around it and stretching uh, the uh, tendon as it attaches up the elbow. Um, so it doesn't change our rehab. And I have to say that I probably, it's about 50-50 for what I have seen in, in the practice when I've seen it, but, um, we haven't seen a lot of them, so I don't know that I'm any any good judge on the success. Yeah, I think it's you know it's I think it's important to know that that is an option out there, and each person is different and responds you know differently to you know different injections and things like that. Again, going back to our overall theme, depending on what is going on, whether that's a joint disease, whether it's a tendon issue, whether it's a bursitis, right? Making sure that you have the right diagnosis before you're undergoing you know, a PRP or a stem cell injection, you know, and stem cell again is a, is a misnomer, but uh, any of these orthobiologic procedures, making sure that you have the right diagnosis, you have the right care team and they're doing it appropriately, I think is the, you know, the best approach always. I've also never seen anybody with a complication following it. Yeah, the, the data, the data as far as adverse reactions and, and side effects from PRP or biologics is actually quite good. I think that's one of the areas where the research is strongest is that, you know, typically it is, uh, from what I have seen, only, you know, the risk of the actual injection itself. So if there's kind of local swelling or local irritation, um, and obviously the, the minimal risk of infection is, is always there, but doesn't seem to be a major issue. All right, so we're getting close here, but let's see if we can kind of get things wrapped up with a couple more questions. All right, this one's coming to you, Marsha. Best exercises. I feel like you're going to write a write an article here for Facebook. Give me your three best exercises for rotator cuff pathology. 
So it, it, I will say that the best exercises I would start with are shoulder blade retraction. I would include neck retraction because I think postural support around the, around the shoulder is incredibly important. And then external rotation of the arm, which is keeping the elbow down next to the side and gently bringing the arm out to start working on the external rotation at the shoulder. But it also depends on what rotator cuff muscle is torn where it's torn, how badly it's torn, because we're talking about four separate muscles. And so uh, to try to just give you exercises without knowing what we're talking about makes it really, really difficult. That's the appropriate and correct therapist response. <laughs> There's no way to sum up three perfect exercises for each individual. It's different with each individual and, and each injury. But Gary, question to you, what are your three exercises that you recommend? Sorry about that. Um, I agree completely with this shoulder blade retraction, the external rotation. Um, I will usually have them do very slow, kind of slow motion, like sort of a row, like you're starting a snowblower or a lawnmower in slow motion, um, just to pull the shoulder back and um, those are, and then just standing against the wall with your back against the wall and just working on pulling your shoulders back, just pulling your shoulders back and holding them. That's usually my, and your head back too. So that's the postural one, but yeah, otherwise it depends which muscles um, and depends what, where they're having the difficulty, but definitely the external rotation one and definitely getting the shoulders back is a good place to start. And I, you know, I agree as well. You know, a lot of times when there's rotator cuff tendinopathy or, or tear or pathology, the way that it, it changes the movement of the shoulder blade and the shoulder in general, you know, it can cause further damage and, and not to mention where we are in the world and what we're doing with zoom and phones and this and that having more of that retraction of the shoulder blades, I think can have a lot of benefits, you know, regardless of rotator cuff pathology, but I, I need to do it right now while I'm sitting here, I've been slouched over for an hour. Okay, last question here as we're wrapping things up, and this goes for all of us. The question is, would you recommend acupuncture for these areas? So let's keep it, let's keep it confined to joint disease for above the waist. Would you recommend acupuncture? Nima? Yeah, we kind of touched a little bit, or I mentioned it a little bit earlier. If something has little harm and may have a benefit, and it can help a patient of mine that maybe I'm having a hard time helping, or the, I, I communicate a lot with physical therapists and they're having a hard time helping. Why not? Let's give it a shot. You know, none of us should be so, so proud to, to say that there isn't someone else out there that can help out. So just check the ego at the door. Marsha. I would totally agree with that. There is, is minor risk in trying it. The literature is kind of all over the place because it's sort of hard to, to do a randomized control trial and, and have consistency in these studies. So it's, it's hard to say that the literature supports it completely, but there's no, no risk other than uh, having the, the little needle go in. That's about the best, the biggest risk there is. So it's definitely worth, some, worth trying. Gary? If it can make a tangible difference in your level of function and your level of pain um, in your personal experience, then go ahead. Is there a certain number of sessions that you recommend or, or attempts rather to see if there's benefit that you en encourage patients to you know, give it a shot? Uh, do you say after one, one appointment, you may or may not feel a difference? Two, does it matter? I would leave it to the acupuncture practitioner because that is way out of my field. And I don't know what the recommendation is for the number of times before we should see a result. So I would leave it to the practitioner. I totally agree. Um, and just to piggyback off that in general, that goes for a lot of fields. One thing that I'd love to say to patients is one of my pet peeves when I'm really trying to help someone get better is when someone goes to one session of physical therapy and they've had a problem for 10 years and they said it didn't really help me. And I don't, I don't love to hear that because, you know, it takes work on our part as the individual, as the patient, and we have to, we have to put an effort and, you know, chronic problems generally uh, require chronic treatments, you know, acute problems sometimes need surgery and things like that. But, 
you know, things like weight loss and physical therapy can sometimes be the two best things in our treatment uh, course. And so I love them to give their therapist a try. And sometimes if they don't mesh, I say, don't quit PT on me. Let's just try someone else that you may mesh better with. And we can tell too in three to four weeks of treatment, whether it's going in the right direction or not. And we'll, we can always communicate back to the physician as well, you know, whether we're seeing objective and subjective improvements or not. Um, we also are very cognizant of if we're not helping someone that they, it should go down a different path possibly as well. You know, I think Nima really it hit the nail on the head. It's taken you 30 years to get into this position, expecting it to get better in one or two sessions is, is really not going to happen, especially if you go home and you're back at your computer, you're looking through the bottom of your bifocals and you're uh, malaligned all over again. Right. It, you know, it's going to take some time to undo the, the patterns that have been created. It's a process and it's a team effort and it starts with the patient. It starts with the individual and putting the work in and staying consistent and trusting the process. Absolutely. All right. Well, that pretty much takes us to the end of the rapid fire questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking part. I think we got through almost all of those. That was pretty good. Excellent job, everyone. And <clears throat> I know I, I speak for the 240 participants tonight and the it racked up 75 meaningful questions that uh, this is the best 75 minutes I've spent today and uh, very useful. Hunter, you hang on to your Screen Actors Guild card, baby, because you are, you are smooth, you add value, you make it seamless, and you're branded. So you can't do better than that. Well, with this, this right here, this is on brand. That's that it. That logo. That's it. And he has the best hair. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? The... Uh, Gary and Nima, you broke down <laughs> complex information for us, made it accessible for lay people like me. And, you know, that makes such a difference. Thank you so much. And Marsha, while I was off screen, I told my wife that <clears throat> a top doc said I should play more golf and buy custom clubs. So thanks for that. And uh, you get five stars and we'll get my highest evaluation after this. Uh, so no, great, great show. Thank you for everyone for being with us and, and uh, thank you for the presentations. Let me tell you, if you thought this was good, we have more. We have some upcoming webinars that I wanted to share with you. Uh, listen to this, Sleep and Fatigue Strategies for Arthritis, April 22nd. Uh, and a Facebook Live event, Fitness Solutions for Arthritis, Cardio Aerobics, May 5th. Supplements, herbs, and oils for arthritis symptoms. That should be interesting on May 12th, which is my birthday at six o'clock. Men in chronic pain, overcoming stigma, finding solutions June 17th. And where if you like podcasts, you've got to you've got to check out ours. We crossed 50,000 downloads this week, which is fantastic. It was an event on brain fog, which I've experienced. And uh you know, don't forget about our connect groups, our online community. They're being used more than ever and expanded. Our online community is available to all, uh, along with our helpline, where we have trained people who can instantly give you useful information or, or point you in the right direction to find it. You can also leave, uh, uh, you know, if you don't want to call, you can, you can leave uh, and write to I need help. Um, and I, and I really want to give you a big plug. Insights surveys are so important to us. They help le lead to this program tonight. And all of us wonder in today's world what we might be able to do to change the world. And this is it. This is your opportunity to help guide the programming, the resources of the Arthritis Foundation. And you know, if you thought this was a good 75 minutes, just give us another 10. Uh, it'll really make a difference. So last reminder, you'll, you will get a uh, survey, give us your feedback, and uh, I'm sure happy to have been with you today. It's my honor, and uh, I hope that you all stay healthy, stay well, and uh, have a good night. Take care.